Good afternoon, everyone. This is Caitlin from TechServe Alliance, and welcome to today's webinar, Redeploy Candidates and Become a Lifetime Agent. There will be a question and answer session after the presentation, so feel free to write in any questions you want answered in the question box on the right side of your screen. We are also recording today's presentation, which will be available to TechServe members on the TechServe Alliance website and will be sent out in follow-up emails. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Barb Bruno. Thanks so much, Caitlin. And uh, I have to welcome all of you. And I know many of you are on spring break and we're recording this call right before the Easter and Passover holidays. So I give you kudos for being on the call today. And I can tell you, I did actually a round table when uh, TechServe Alliance has their conferences, they do a meetup and all the tables have different topics. And this was my topic. And Mark Roberts and Susan were making fun of me because I started with my group way before we were supposed to start. And I had like 25 people at my table of six because this was such a hot topic. So I'm glad that they asked me to do this because isn't this you know, extremely important to all of us? Think of all the candidates that are out there that you've taken so much time to identify and how often are you redeploying them? You know, the percentages are extremely low. So what we're gonna talk about today is how do you redeploy them? How do you become their lifetime agent? There is a tremendous benefit in redeploying your contractors. In the contract staffing profession, such a small percentage of contractors are redeployed. So how do you position yourself as their lifetime agent while you help your contractors achieve not only their short, but as well as their long-term career goals? Uh, many of your clients will choose to work contract for many reasons, including a better work-life balance. And this is really important to younger generations. The year 2020 is a milestone where more than 50% of the workforce will not be working their traditional 40-hour work week. And so that you know, is to your advantage. Another thing that's really impacting this is over 50% of the workforce is going to be millennials as of 2020. So not only will 50% of the workforce be working flexible, 50% of the workforce is going to be millennials. They are now the majority in the workforce. But by next year, I mean, we're not even a year away, they're gonna represent 50% of the workforce. And, and one of their priorities is work-life balance, which is good for you and me. Can you imagine the value of an individual who works as a contractor for you their entire career? You, know, you wanna enjoy the benefits of continued referrals from these candidates based on their positive experience of working for you. And I've always said, when you have contractors out there, they're either your little army of recruiters bringing people to you because they love to work for you, they love your company, they feel like you're nurturing them, you're helping them reach their goals. So they're either your army of recruiters bringing other contractors to you, or they're being recruited away by other contractors that are working for other contract staffing firms. And so if you're not redeploying your candidates, they're not your little army of recruiters. And imagine that. Imagine if every contractor you have out there loves your company, loves you, you know, is treated so well that they want to bring everybody they know to your company so they can go on different contracts together. That's what you want to get. Um, there are five basic rules to follow when you're trying to nurture a long-standing relationship. You've always got to do the right thing. You know, it, it, we can't just go out there and, and force people to take contracts or try to force work on them that we know is not a good fit. We've always got to do the best job you can. When you go through the door of your office or if you're working virtual, you know, the minute you sit down at your desk, I don't care what else is going on in your life, you've got to work at a level 10. We've got people's lives in our hands. You can never be at an eight or a seven or walk into the office and say, you know, it's going to be one of those days. Because when you do that, you spend all day proving yourself right. And we've got people's lives in our hands. And yes, you can advance their careers or you can hurt their careers. You've got to treat other people the way they want to be treated. And that was something I had to learn because I was raised to treat people the way I wanted to be treated. And I felt that way for most of my life, that as long as I treated people the way I wanted to be treated, that that was a good thing to do. And then I realized they're not me. They don't have my, my same core values. They don't have my experience. They might not have my personal or professional situation. So I've learned to switch that to treating other people the way they want to be treated. I always take my direction from the contractors that I'm working with. I never assume for a minute that what they're doing is what they want to do next. I really want to see the world through their eyes. Because if I listen really well and I, I see the world through their eyes, 
and they can treat them the way they want to be treated. Number four, you've got to realize it's all about them and not you. I know you're under pressure to fill contracts. I know that the salespeople come in and go, you know, we need candidates. You know, I'm sure your owner or manager, you know, wants you to fill a majority of the contracts that are written. But again, it's not about you. It really is about the candidate. You know, you can't go out and reach out to somebody and only present one job because how do you know what to present before you talk to them and you really find out what's most important to them and what they want to do next. And rule number five, you've got to realize it's not your job to agree or disagree with contractors. This is a lesson I had to learn early in my career because I can so remember interviewing people and they would leave my office and I would go like, oh my God, what an idiot. I can't believe they said that. I can't believe they did that. Or I would be debriefing a client after an interview and I'd say, my candidate said, what? What did they say? Like I was always so astounded by things people said or did. But then I realized later in my career, not my job to agree or disagree with them. What I have to do is position myself as the best listener in their life and see the world through their eyes. You know, what are they going through? Unless I'm walking in their shoes, I can't understand the reasons why they do things. If you do these five rules, what, what this does is it answers the three questions that your candidates want answered. They want to know if they can trust you. They want to know if you care about them. And they want to know if you're committed to provide results. Because most of the contractors you and I are talking to have worked with another recruiter. As an industry, as a profession, we only place 5% of the candidates that we attract. And so 95% of the people that reach out to us, we never do anything for. So when you're talking to somebody, they might have been part of that 95% with another recruiter. So they want to know if you're going to be a waste of their time or if you're really going to do something for them. So sometimes in those first conversations, they're very guarded. They're not giving you everything. They might be kind of short because they're on their job. You know, we've got to call them when they can talk openly. But these are the questions they want to know. Can I trust you? Do you care about me? And are you going to give me some results? Or are you going to end up being a waste of my time? When you realize these are the three questions that everyone wants answered, you change the way you approach contractors. You're always showing them the benefit of using you. If you want to be a lifetime agent for somebody, that's something you have to earn. If you want all your contractors to be a little army of recruiters for you, you've really got to be nurturing them. You can't place them and forget them because then they're going to be recruited by another contractor that's working for another contract staffing firm. And I had some firms at the Tech Serve Alliance Conference admit that they don't redeploy 5% of their contractors, that they're lucky if they, they redeploy 5%. Think of all the work you're going through to find these people. And again, I asked you a question earlier. Think of the value if you place somebody throughout their entire career, if you put positioned yourself as their lifetime career agent. Most recruiters are diligent, you know, when they've, you know, when they've recruited a candidate. Think for a moment about the number of emails and text and phone calls that, that are made to accomplish the following when you're recruiting them, when you obtain their resume or CV, or they tell you to look at their LinkedIn profile. When you're setting up you know, their interview with you, you're presenting appropriate contract opportunities or direct opportunities, you're scheduling an interview with your client, you're doing reference checks, you're verifying credentials, certifications, education, you're pepping and debriefing the candidate and the client, you're providing feedback and you're extending an offer. So think about all the activity and how much time it takes you to do all of those things. And, and again, you're not paid a dime, by the way, for any of the things that are on the screen right now. You know, that's the interesting thing about what you and I do. We do a lot of work for nothing. The only time we're paid is if somebody accepts a job and they show up and they do the work and then you're paid. And so we do a lot of work for nothing, but we're really communicating with them often and don't only communicate by email or text. I'm telling you, that's one of the biggest mistakes people are making because you cannot establish rapport when you're only texting and emailing. You know, and you might say that's your candidate's preferred way of communicating. Of course it is. If they don't see the benefit of talking to you, they'll talk to you if they see the benefit to them. If they don't, they'll insist on texting an email. So if they're not talking to you, what that tells you as a recruiter is, you know what? My candidates don't see the benefit in talking to me. If they don't see the benefit in talking to me, how am I ever gonna become their lifetime career agent? What are my chances of redeploying somebody? What are my chances of the contractor even taking the contract and staying for the duration of the contract? I'm hearing so many nightmares 
where you know your contractors are out there working and all of a sudden you get a call from the client your contractor went to lunch and never came back you know there's a reason for that you put them in a contract that they didn't see as their next career move maybe it was a lateral move maybe they took it because they had nothing else and they kept interviewing so every time we're pointing the finger at the contractors we have to point back to us if we want to redeploy them if we want to become their lifetime career agent we really have to conduct much more thorough interviews. We've got to really listen to them better and see the world through their eyes so we can do a better job. Your ability to establish rapport and set yourself up as a lifetime career agent is really solidified during your interviewing process. If you're only interviewing for one job, you know, you presented a job to them up front and you're only, you know, talking to them about one job, believe me, believe me, they are not viewing you as somebody that cares about them. In fact, when I talk to contractors, I go to technology conferences, and I'm usually the only one from our profession that is talking at these technology conferences, that is actually speaking. And what they'll say to me is, you don't care about us, you just care about your clients. You have a job, you call as many people as you can call until somebody finally says yes, but you don't care about me. You know, you've got to ask them about their long and short term goals. It's okay to determine if they want to you know, become a contractor and, and be a contractor long term, or are they looking for a contract to hire type of opportunity? You've got to ask them if there are certain skills that they want to add to their resume to enhance their marketability, because that's what contractors want to do. They don't want to take a lateral move. They want to constantly learn new things, add things to their resume or CV, where the next contract they know they can earn a lot of money. When your contractors share their goals with you and you know and you express your ability to help them get there they're going to be much more inclined to come back to you when their contract ends you know but again i don't think many of us say i'd love to be your lifetime career agent give me your short and long-term goals when i see your long-term goal i'll know what type of opportunities to present to you now that can get you to where you want to be in three to five years we've got to start talking that way we can't just say i have a contract are you interested i have a job are you interested you know, we've got to talk to them first. How can you sell to somebody until you know what's most important to them first? It's like I love when people call me and they're trying to sell me things that I have no need for. I don't return any of those calls because, number one, they didn't ask me any questions up front to even pre-qualify me. And too often, that's what we do. We go pitching a job and we never find out what they see themselves doing next. And sometimes they'll accept a contract, but they keep interviewing because you really didn't find out what was most important to them. You can differentiate yourself from other recruiters who, who just constantly pitch one opportunity if you say, I want to know what's important to you. I want to know what you see as your next career move. I'm going to take my direction from you, and I'm only going to call you when I've got something that represents your next career move, and let's make sure that the next career move enhances your resume or CV, and it, it positions you for what you want to do long term. Think about that for a moment. That's talking to them totally different than the way most recruiters talk to them who are only pitching for a job. You know, too often you only communicate with your contractors, you know, um, when they're receiving a weekly paycheck. You know, if they if they don't hear from you, you know, if if you've been talking to them daily and you place them out on a contract and all of a sudden the communication abruptly ends, contractors know they're earning money for you every single hour they work. And if they don't feel you care about them, believe me, they're gonna spread the wealth and they're gonna let another recruiter place them in, in the next opportunity. I've had contractors say that to me at conferences. And I go, why don't you go back to the person that, that you know, placed you in this job? You know, I know they're making money on me. That's, I'm just dollar signs to them. And so I believe in spreading the wealth. And so this time I'll go with one, you know, one recruiter and I'll hear from contractors I'm working with where they're going next. And often I just go where they're going, you know, as long as it's more money. And so they're not viewing you as somebody that cares about their career. They think you view them as a paycheck. And are you paid for every hour they work? You are. But they can't feel like they're only a dollar sign to you. If you place them and you don't send them a birthday card, you know, we've got Easter holiday and Passover this coming weekend. You know, have you sent, you know, do you know if your people celebrate Easter? Do they celebrate, you know, um, um I'm trying to think Orthodox Easter, which is next week, you know, Passover starts on Friday. You got to know what holidays your contractors celebrate and you need to celebrate with them. You're not going to send an Easter greeting to somebody um, who is celebrating Passover. 
you're not going to send an Easter greeting to a contractor who is is basically celebrating Orthodox Easter next Sunday. You know, we've got our database separated, you know, where we know what holidays, we know, you know, what our people celebrate, what teams they back, you know, what are their likes and dislikes. And we reach out to them constantly. You've got to make that, you know, you've got to nurture them. It's no different than a friendship. You know, are you sending them, a, you know, a birthday card? Look for every excuse to communicate with them. Don't only call them, you know, when you're asking for referrals. Call them and ask them how the contract's going. You know, find out if they're happy. Find out what they like most, what they like least. You know, when this contract is over, don't talk to them 90 days out, you know, because they've already got something else lined up. And if the only time they heard from you, they've been out on a contract a year or 18 months, and the only time they heard from you is 90 days before they're leaving, they're not happy with you because now they feel, oh, you're going to lose your, your, you know, your, your money that you're making on me. So now you reach out to me. You've got to talk to them. And even at the TechServe conference, I was at the bar having drinks with um, some contractors at the last TechServe conference, and they were really quizzing me on this. And they go, Barb, we don't call because we don't want to know. We don't want to know what's going on. And I go, of course you do. And they go, what if there is a problem? I said, well, you can become part of the solution. And often it's a little issue that you can solve. And you want to jump in before it becomes a major project. And they just walk off the contract, which makes you look very bad. So, of course, you want to keep in touch. You have to develop a follow-up process. They can't only feel like a paycheck. Because then again, they're not going to be your little army of recruiters. And I want you to sit back right now and just imagine if every contractor you have out on a job right now, if they referred one additional person to you, and if every one of them came back to you when their contract was over for you to redeploy them, what is that impact on your level of success and your income and your future in this profession? It's tremendous. We don't put near enough attention on redeployment. And it's something you really have to work at. And I'm telling you, celebrate everything. You know, celebrate St. Patrick's Day, celebrate Valentine's Day, celebrate, you know, M&M Day, celebrate whatever you can possibly celebrate with them. You know, and the reason what we do with our contractors is we get them a very big, gigantic candy decanter that's in their work area. And we have it delivered, filled with candy on their first day of employment. And because it's so big, and I bought these things at Old Time Pottery for $9.99. And I asked them, how many do you have? And he said, we have like 60. And I go, what about other stores? And I ended up buying like 350 of these candy decanters because they were obnoxious and heavy and huge. So I knew people wouldn't take them home. They would leave them at work. But we fill them with candy constantly and every other contractor comes and gets candy off the desk of our contractor. And they always say, who keeps filling that with candy? Well, my contract firm does. Something as simple as that. They're like, wow, that, that's something really different. That's something, wow. You know, you'd be amazed at how that how much money that candy makes us because other contractors see that we're constantly doing things and celebrating our contractors. You've got to do that. You can't place me and forget me if you want to redeploy me. You just can't do that. Now, you have to have a follow up and a touch program. The way you follow up and communicate is a very important part of establishing a lifetime relationship with your candidates. If you don't have a precise follow up or touch program, um, that is an action item, you know, that, that you have on your Outlook calendar, then this is something, this should be an action item that you put. So after this webinar, you set this up for yourself. Because if it's not on your Outlook calendar, trust me, it's not going to get done. Because we work at such a fast pace and we probably tell ourselves, I don't have time to follow up with candidates. I just don't have time. You know, I've got so many other contracts I'm trying to fill. I'm telling you, you can't afford not to make time to follow up with these people. And it doesn't have to be during prime time hours. It can be first thing in the morning, over the lunch hour, at the end of the day. It doesn't have to be when you're out there reaching out to other contractors or closing deals. But you either communicate with them and nurture them or they're not coming back. And they're not gonna be your recruiter. And when somebody said, well, what firm do you work for? I don't know. It makes me sad when I, when I meet contractors. And at the last technology conference I was at, a lot of contractors were attending and I would always ask them, well, what firm, you know, are you working for? And they go, let me think about that. And they almost have to think about their paycheck. And I go, well, do you remember the recruiter that placed you? And they go, not really, not really. You've got to be memorable. You've got to make them feel very good about themselves. You've got to let them talk about themselves because then they're going to realize that you're different. 
that you do care about them. Remember, do you care about me? Can I trust you? Are you going to do what you're telling me you can do? And even if you don't place somebody, if you treat them right, they're going to still come back to you and they're still going to give you referrals. It's so important. Rapport is destroyed when expectations are not clear. This can, again, hurt your chances of redeploying a contractor. Every staffing and recruiting from out there is unique. And you know what that does? It confuses the candidates. And I can tell you when I'm at a TechServe conference and I do a lot of in-house training for TechServe members and I can go into one company that's a TechServe member and then go into another company, even in the same state, doing the exact same niche and the company is set up totally differently. They don't understand how we work. They don't know what to expect, you know, and they don't, they, they honestly, I do not know what you and I do for them. They have no idea of the work that you do on their behalf. You know, but if they start realizing that you want to be their agent, that you're going to take your direction from them, that you're listening to them, you're not judging them. You're trying to put yourself in their shoes and see the world through their eyes. And you're asking them, where do you want to be in two or three years? Let's help you get there. You know, I can help you make those moves that help you get there. You know, they don't want to hear from you. They're insulted when you haven't called them the whole time they've been out on a contract and you call them 90 or 120 days out before their contract is over, I'm telling you, they've already got something lined up. And even if your employer wants to extend their contract, often they won't do it because they've got something lined up. Or if they do it, they want more money because they know they'll get more money if they go to any other new contract. And so when you're negotiating contracts with your clients, you've got to make sure that if they extend the contract, you have it in writing that your bill rate is increased because your pay rate's got to be increased. For a contract to be extended that's something that your salespeople have to do but provide written expectations to your candidate let them know what they can expect from you after they're placed and what you expect from them after they're placed you should be giving them a list of expectations when you first work with them and if you follow my training i've taught you to do that that when you're working with somebody right after you talk to them send them a list of expectations this is what you can expect from me this is what i need from you to find you a contract you're going to accept without hesitation. But there has to be a secondary expectation list. This is what you can expect from me after you're placed. And this is what I need from you after you're placed. Because we forget to do that, you know, and we never want to be out of sight, out of mind. We never want to, you know, we don't want them to forget us. You know, you've got to be memorable. You've got to show them that you care. You know, you've got to be a person that they're going to be very comfortable sending other people to throughout your conversation with your candidates. You want to inform them that it's your intention to become, number one, the best listener in their life. I'm going to listen to understand where you're coming from. I, it's not my job to agree or disagree with anything that you say. And it's not my job to, to judge what you tell me. You know, that's not what I want to do. I want to listen to understand where you're coming from. I want to see the world through your eyes. Because if I do that, I can do a better job for you. I would love to be your lifetime agent. You tell me where you want, what you want to do now. What's your next career move? And where you see yourself in three to five years, I can help you get there. Because, you know, once we increase your marketability with every contract, you know, I can put you in the contracts that will get you where you want to go. I can be your eyes and your ears in the job market throughout your entire career. As things change, I can inform you of those. I'm a workforce workplace expert. And I can protect you. I can make sure we're putting you in companies that can offer you what it is that you want. You know, and if you need advice, pick up the phone and ask me. We have got to be accessible to the people that we place in jobs. Now, you don't want to be a free career consultant to the candidates you're not going to place in jobs. The 95% you don't place in jobs, you've got to provide them with a resource, give them something to do so they quit calling you. The average recruiter spends 90 minutes a day, think about that, an hour and a half every day giving free advice to candidates they're never going to place in a job. They don't have the skills, the stability, experience. You've got to provide them with resources and move on and focus on the 5% that you're going to place. You state often that you will take your direction from them and that their priorities become your priorities. You know, and again, when they realize that, that you're taking your direction from them, they're more inclined to give you directives. And also, the more important you make another person feel, the higher the level of trust. You know, I, I, I cringe every time I hear a trainer say, control your candidates. You can't control a candidate. You know, any of those of you that have teenagers or children, you know you can't control another human being, even when you're their parent. What makes you think you're going to control a candidate? But you can earn, you know, trust based on rapport. 
you know, once you develop rapport, that leads to trust, you know, and the more important you make them feel. And when you tell them, I take my direction from you, you know, and, and, and you show them the benefit of utilizing you, you don't sell at them before you know what's important to them. And that's a mistake that everybody is making. I hear everybody screaming, we can't find candidates. The problem is too many of you are going after the same 15% that your clients are going after. The job board candidates, people that are active on LinkedIn, people that are answering website postings. You're a recruiter, you've got to go out there and give them access to the other 85%. But again, to attract them, you've got to sound different. You've got to say, I know you're busy, you're doing a job, you know, um, I can be your eyes and ears in the job market, Tell me what you see yourself doing next. I'm only going to call you when I'm representing that opportunity. You want to be their lifetime agent. Find out what's important to them. Truly take your direction from them. I mentioned that the millennials now represent the majority in the workforce as the baby boomers continue to retire. This generation provides great opportunities for anybody in the contract staffing professional in profession because they value work-life balance. And unlike the baby boomers who lived to work, okay, the millennials work to live. And the millennials, they're referred to, this is the most scrutinized generation I've ever seen, you know, and I've learned to work very well with the millennials, you know, and I am a baby boomer. They've been called the job hopping generation. They're not. Um, this is a great concern for talent acquisition professionals and hiring managers, you know, worldwide. But before you judge this gig mentality, Realize you're in the contract staffing profession and this mentality is great for you, you know, because millennials are convinced that if they leave a job, they're going to get another job without any problem and they're going to make more money. <clears throat> they truly believe that. And in most instances, that's exactly what happens. And they don't hesitate. If they think that, that you can help them make the job moves that they want to make and they're looking to work for organizations where they have an impact on the company mission or vision, mission, mission or vision. They want to know that what this company backs is things that they believe in. You know, you, you've got to learn to work with the millennials because they're 15, 50% of the workforce right now, you know, and again, they're going to be very good for your career if you learn to understand them and quit judging them. The competition for talented contractors is going to continue to escalate, okay? Nurturing your candidates is going to help you represent the best talent, and it's going to enhance your ability to respond faster. Because what our clients want now is they don't only want the best candidates, they want them faster than they've ever wanted them before. You know, and I laugh because when I'm talking to these hiring authorities, I speak at a lot of conferences where I'm speaking to the end users. I'm trying to show people why they should utilize our profession. And I've been doing this now for three years. In fact, I'm going to be in Austin at the RecruitCon conference, which is all talent acquisition professionals. And I'm the only one from our profession speaking again on the, on, the, on the program. So I know I'm going to get objections the minute they introduce me. But it's interesting, you know, that, that when you nurture your candidates um, and you share expectations with both your candidates and clients, they start to understand more of what we do. And they need your services more than ever right now. Everybody needs your services right now. We just have to do things differently. What I want to do now is I want to share some of the ideas that were shared at my roundtable at TechServe Alliance, because I think I'm always learning. And the reason I go out there and I do in-house training and I do consulting and I do a lot of other things is I'm trying to go out there and see what everybody's doing. And then I can share it with you. And so there were some great ideas that were shared at my roundtable. And I now want to share them with you because these are some of the things that people were doing that were ending up having them redeploy, you know, much higher percentage of their contractors. Number one, and we talked about, create a specific dated follow-up process for all contractors on your Outlook calendar. Recruiters, you can't depend on salespeople only to touch these candidates. When you recruited them, you're the one that convinced them to take the job. They gotta hear from you. You know, again, you don't wanna be out of sight, out of mind. You should invite your contractors to your company events. If your company has a Christmas party, if your company has an outing, your contractors should be invited. Outside sales reps should interact with your consultants on site. Take them to lunch. Let them know how much you care about them. You know, invite contractors to sporting events with your internal employees. You know, um, the large candy jar delivered on the first day of employment and keep filling it up with candy. You know, all different to celebrate every holiday and everything that's going on out there. Look at referral programs to encourage your contractors to recruit, you know, other people for you versus being recruited by somebody. 
I want you all to think about that army of recruiters that you're not utilizing. You know, you might sit there and say, it's so hard to find candidates. Imagine if every month, half of your contractors gave you a name of somebody that's a great contractor. How would that change your success level? You know, you've got all these people out there that are working and yes, you're earning money on them every hour, but unless you nurture them, you're not gonna get referrals and they're not gonna redeploy. So this is a, a tremendously lost opportunity. You've really got to start working on this. So there's got to be a lucrative referral program. Negotiate raises up front with clients if contracts are extended. Because if you don't do that, what I see too many contract staffing firms do, and if, I, if I've got any owners and managers on this call, I've seen owners barely break even or lose money after a contract's been extended, you know, one or two or three times. Because, you know, the, the company is saying, well, that's the bill rate you quoted us. You know, that's the bill rate that we're going to pay. And yet your contractor wants an increase every time the contract is extended. So you've got to start looking at this because understand something. Your owner is in business to make money. If you don't make money for them, they couldn't provide this training for you through TechServe Alliance. They couldn't even afford to belong to TechServe Alliance. So the fact that you work for a company that belongs to TechServe, that provides this training for you, you work for a successful company and you've got to protect the bottom line of your owner. You never want to leave any money on the table, you know, because your owner is in not, not in business to provide a job for you. They're in business to make a profit, which is a good thing because the more profitable the firm, the more they can do for you. You've got to keep in touch with contractors to make sure that your employees are happy. You know, you've got to call them. And if there is an issue, you've got to jump in. You can hear something and then have selective hearing. I'm going to just pretend I didn't hear that. You know, you have got to address anything that comes up. You, you know, you, they've got to realize you're their agent. You're their lifetime career agent. You're their advocate. And if there's a problem, you want to go and try to solve it. Because if you don't, they're going to quit anyway. They're going to go to lunch one day and just not show up. If it's something that can't be solved, maybe you have to replace the contractor and put them in another contract. But at least now you've satisfied the client and the contractor because you try to solve something. They couldn't come to an agreement. Sometimes they can reassign your contractor to a different job and they're perfectly happy because they may love your contractor, but your contractor is not happy. People are having problems finding top talent. But remember, you know, you're only as good as the caliber of person you put out there and if they're engaged and happy. You wanna provide contractors with additional training. Anytime you can provide any contractors with any kind of training, you wanna do that because contractors are always looking to enhance their skills and you can offer them something online. It doesn't have to be something that, that, that's delivered by webinar or whatever. You could offer them something they can access online, but try to help them enhance their skills. Um, you know, you've got multiple contractors, a food truck or an ice cream truck. Food trucks are like a walking billboard for your company because when a food truck shows up, you know, and, and you're, you're offering a free lunch to all your contractors. And I know many firms, when they take an ice cream truck on site, they just give free ice cream to everybody. You know, that's better than any recruiting call you're ever going to make, especially on a hot summer day. Just a great idea. If profits allow, you know, I, a lot of firms are now having somebody that is their contractor concierge and they're focused on improving the contractor's experience out there. But that does not mean that the recruiters are not still keeping in touch. You've got somebody who's constantly going out there and making sure they're happy and, and they're actually calling it a contractor concierge and the person knows that they can call this person, but who do they really want to talk to? If you put me out on contract and even if you have a contractor concierge, who do I want to talk to? I want to talk to the recruiter that placed me in the job because you told me you care about me and you told me that you want to be my lifetime agent. If I have an issue, I want to talk to you. So you've got to be open because again, you might think I don't have time to do that. I'm telling you, stop talking to the 95% of people that you're never going to place and really nurture and take care of the contractors you place in jobs and the 5% that you're going to place in jobs in the future. And you want to celebrate anything and everything. Anytime there's an excuse to celebrate, I believe in celebrating anything and everything. You know, And I've given you on your handout some, some ideas of what you can celebrate. On Valentine's Day, saying, send candy with a card. Love that you work for us. On St. Patrick's Day, a lottery ticket. We're so lucky to have you working for us. Birthdays, handwritten birthday cards that are sent to their home address. You know, delivering food for contractors and coworkers. 
um, tying promotions into sporting events or anything local. What are local festivals? What are local things that go on in your area, in your community that you can celebrate? You know, National M&M Day, Cheesecake Day, or whatever day you decide to celebrate. If you go online and you just put daily holidays, every day has like six or seven different holidays for every single day. You know, and just tie in what you're doing to, to holidays that people don't even know exist. Deliver items that are noticeable but don't always have your name on them. You know, what about an appreciation day? This is just a day we're appreciating you. So there's nothing going on. You just show up and you, you, you take them to lunch or you do something special to just say, I appreciate you. That goes so long. But this has to be a process. This can't be something that you do haphazard. If you're going to embrace redeploying your candidates, somebody has to take over this effort. Somebody has to take over this effort because nationwide, the percentage of contractors who are redeployed with their current firms is under 10%. Isn't that sad? When you think of all the work you went through to recruit these contractors, interviewed and get them out there, begin every single relationship with your candidate that your goal is to earn the role of their lifetime career agent. Say that to them. They probably have never heard that. You know, share your intentions. Differentiate, differentiate yourself, not by what you say, but what you do. And your redeployment rate will be much higher. People don't judge people on what they say. Most people judge people on what they do. And, you know, I, I for one, absolutely do that because I find talk cheap. Anybody can talk a great game, but do their actions back up what they're saying? If you say you care about me, but you put me in a job and you never called me to see if I was happy, I don't think you cared about me. I think you cared about your paycheck and I enhanced it every hour that I worked. So I'm not happy. The benefits the candidates, you know, the, the, this benefits the candidates you're representing and your ability to present the best talent to your clients. Because when somebody's happy, they bring their friends along. And by the way, millennials love to work in packs. They love to bring their friends. You know, I had somebody recently show up for one of our contracts and he brought his friend to his first day of employment and the company called me and said, were you aware of the fact that, that the person we hired brought their friend um, and wanted to know if we had something for them? And it's ironic, but you know, after we talked to them for a short period of time, we are putting them on, but we don't even know if you have paperwork on this person. We didn't, we didn't. So now we had to back, <laughs> we had to call and find out who the person was. And luckily it's a great client of ours. But literally, one of our contractors took somebody to work with them and, and asked if there was any opportunity for them. And that's going to happen more and more because, you know, they love to help their friends and, and don't necessarily know the rules or follow the rules. Remember, your contractors are either your army of recruiters or they're being recruited away. And, and I just feel that, you know, it's, we spend so much money and so much time finding this talent that why would we ever let them be recruited away? You know, we want to recruit them. Now, what I've done, you know, we did not get into redeployment in the certification study guide because the certification study guide was teaching best practices. And, and redeployment is not something that we covered in the certification exam. We covered just about everything else. But that's why we do these webinars to also enhance your knowledge because all of these webinars come for the continuing education for certification. And I can tell you at the Staffing Industry Analyst event this year, they were putting a tremendous amount of um, emphasis on the importance of training and the importance of certification. Your candidates are certified. You've got to verify their certifications and you know that if they don't have certain certifications, you can't place them in a job. Why would you not earn the best certification you can earn in the staffing profession? And, and TechServe Alliance has developed a certification program specifically for people that place IT and engineering contractors and direct hires. You know, it's strictly at IT and engineering. So if you're not certified, please, you know, reach out to TechServe Alliance and get more information on the certification program. Or if you have any questions, you can email them at this email address or you can call that number and they'll be glad to answer any questions you have. So those of you that are that are certified, I want to say congratulations. Those of you that are not, this is something you really want to consider doing. Because again, those letters behind your name tells your candidates and clients that you earn the highest designation that somebody can earn in your profession. And why wouldn't you do that? You know, we don't go to a doctor that doesn't have an MD or a dentist that doesn't have a DDS or an accountant that doesn't have a CPA. Why should somebody use somebody in our profession that's not certified? So please make this a goal for this year. 
you know, because it also enhances your knowledge. It gives you, you know, industry knowledge. It gives you practical knowledge, best practices on how to work your desk and laws. And so it makes you better at your job. Not only does it put a, a, you know letters behind your name, it makes you better at doing your job. And those of you that are certified, I really challenge all of you, take level two because level two is tough because it's the same study guide, but the answers aren't on the test. We give you case studies and you have to apply what you learned to the case study. So if you really wanna know if you've made, you know, retained that information, I would challenge any of you to take level two because there's not that many people that have the level two certification. And so obviously there's another marketable, you know, skill set and credential that you can market to your candidates and clients. All right, what I wanna do now is open the lines for questions. I think that's the most important part of any call that I do. You can ask me questions one of two ways. Go to the control panel on your right. And if you put in the access code, the pin number and the phone number, you can go to the panel toward the top and you see that circle. You can click on that and I can unmute your lines and I can answer any questions. Or if you would just like to type a question in, you can go down below where it says questions and you can you know, type in any question. And again, if you don't want me to say your first name, I always say first names just to be friendly, but if you don't want me to use your first name, just put the word confidential or anonymous first and I won't use your name. So let me see if I have anybody that's brave enough to raise their hand. I see no hands being raised. And again, when you raise your hand and you ask me a question, I can do so much more because it's not just answering a typed in question. You know, you and I could role play. I've closed deals for people. You know, the reason TechServe brings me live to you is because I want to be able to answer your questions. Okay, so let me go to questions. Let's see. Our redeployment is less than 5%. I don't even know where to start. We don't have a program. I think, I think step number one to improving redeployment is realizing what your redeployment is. So the first thing all of you have to do is you need to study this. How many of your contractors redeploy? How many of them even take your call when you're trying to call them? You know, if you haven't nurtured them, how many even talk to you when you're trying to find out what they want to do next? You know, you've really got to study that. And then anything Anything is better than doing nothing. The first thing I would suggest that most firms do is appoint somebody in charge of the project because this is something that somebody has to embrace. Somebody has to put their arms around it and decide, okay, this is gonna be step one. And all of you have to be involved. Recruiters have to be involved. Salespeople have to be involved. Everybody has to be involved in improving um, contractor redeployment. But this is one of the greatest money makers that you could have in 2019. If you get your arms around this and you do something and you start redeploying contractors, it's absolutely going to positively impact sales, profits, and your income. So, you know, the great thing about redeployment is you're going to see the benefit of it. Your candidates will see the benefit of it, but you've got to go out there and sound different. You've got to go out there and present yourself different. You've got to sound different than every other recruiter out there. So my thing would be first, you know, first employ somebody to take over the program. Secondly, identify, you know, one or two easy steps that you can take. Even if you all decided after I put somebody out on a contract, when are we going to call them and put that on your outlook calendars so that you reach out and you call these contractors and, you know, number one, thank you for accepting the contract. Would love to see how things are going, you know, and, and don't just only ask them for referrals because then you lose the effectiveness. So then they think you don't care about me. You're just trying to get referrals. So make sure that, you know, you find out what's important to them. You ask them questions that uncover what's important to them. Let's see. I see a hand raised. Okay. Um, yeah, Barb, I, I'm going to try and unmute uh, for the the hand. The, yeah, Eileen, <laughs> the can you hand. Hand. Let's see if we can do that. Okay, she, Eileen, are you there? Yeah. We've got you unmuted. I, I am. Can you hear me? I sure can. What's your question? Okay, super. So I understand completely and I've always promoted the deeper conversations uh, up front in the recruiting process when you're first engaging a candidate. Yes. Once they're on assignment, we generally hand that candidate care to the account management team who is making uh -huh. sure, should be making sure, are they happy on the engagement and so forth, as well as what else is going on in the project, you know, looking for opportunities, keeping abreast of what's happening on the contract and when they're due to re redeploy. Mm -hmm. But getting that conversation between sales and recruiting because the salesperson doesn't have that lifetime relationship because mm -hmm. they may get placed on somebody else's account. So how, right. how would you suggest best managing 
the engagement with the candidates, should it really be done by the recruiting team, by the account management team? Are they lifetime of our company or are they lifetime to a person? Any thoughts on merging the two teams when they have distinct responsibilities? My answer would be both. That's something your company has to work out. Like you have to work out because I can tell you the problem with that is often, Eileen, that account managers have every intention of going out there and doing this, but they get caught up on generating new business and doing other things. And and some of the nurturing falls by the side. The other thing too is if, if if I worked for you, Eileen, you recruited me, okay? And 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 I I I went to that job because you got me excited and you recruited me. And yes, somebody else is talking to me, but I sure would have liked to have heard from you. I sure would have liked you to call me the day before I started and wish me luck. I would have liked you to have called me after my first week and see how my first week went. So I think the recruiter has to be interjected in the process and then supplemented by what the account managers are doing. So when I said there has to be a process, I think the answer is all of the above, you know, but you don't want to lose contact. You don't want to turn it over because it's almost like, okay, I'm making my money on you. I'm going to turn you over to someone else, you know, and then I'm going to call you 90 days before it's over and ask if you want another assignment. No, I don't like you because I haven't heard from you. So I don't like you. So it's really the individual, not the relationship with the company per se, because I know some companies even have a third department, which is like a mm -hmm. candidate care department that Absolutely. makes sure everything is okay during the engagement. And then when they're ready for the next project, send them back to the recruiting team. Is that, right. I, think that I think that it's important that their loyalty is to both, that their loyalty is to the company. The company has to do things for these contractors. So you want them to be loyal to your company, absolutely. And, and that's first and foremost, but you also want the recruiter to touch base because that's the person that enticed them. That's the person that presented the job. And so I'm not saying you have to call them once a week, but the recruiter has to be interjected. Even if there's a candidate care department, if you've got a candidate concierge. When I was at the Technical Alliance Conference and those firms that did have a concierge or they had a candidate care department, the recruiters, the, the, the people that still had the recruiters touching had a much higher redeployment than the companies that just had a concierge talking. Thank you. So the answer is all of the above. Okay, I see a bunch of questions. Let, can you mute that line out, um, Caitlin, because I hear a lot of background noise. Okay, yeah, let's see. Absolutely. Some of my team members watch the webinar through my login. Will they receive the recording? Caitlin is going to tell you how you get the recording when this call is done. More of a statement than question. We recently started using a product called Sense, which is a candidate consultant engagement platform, seems to be able to help. Um, I'm not familiar with that program, Noel, but Noel is suggesting that they're using a program called Sense, S-E-N-S-E. -E. This seems to be helping them, so you might want to research that program. I will definitely research that program, Noel, before our next call so I can give you some feedback. Uh, we can set up a drip campaign that is driven by my ATS for example, when a person end date is 30 days out, they get an automated message that we have them in mind, need an updated resume. The message comes from the recruiter. And what I'm going to say to you about the drip campaign, though, Noel, is at the last tech conference, I learned that 82% of emails are not open. People are not opening emails. And, you know, when we say that 30 days out, they're getting an automated message that you have them in mind, you need an updated resume. They've already got their next gig uh, secured. 30 days out is not near enough time. In fact, at the TechServe conference last year, everyone was agreeing that 90 days isn't enough anymore. It's almost like you got to know what 120 days out to really start talking to them about what they want to do next and offer an opportunity that they're going to be happy with. So just sending emails, it, it's no different than autoresponders or that type of thing. It, that's got to be supplemented with conversations. And you might say, candidates don't want to talk to me. If your candidates don't want to talk to you, they don't see the benefit to them. So every time you're going to call somebody, think about the tattoo on their forehead. What's in it for me? Always address the what's in it for me of the candidate. Just wanted to call and see how you're doing. Want to see, you know, how the job is going. You know, I, I just want to make sure you're happy and, and, and repeat things that they said to you in the interview. I know in your interview, you said this was really important. I know this company offers that. How's that working out? Don't just ask general questions that you could ask anybody. Look at your interviewing notes. When you call these people, you know, talk to them and reiterate interviewing notes that you had because nobody has those but you. 
go in your ATS, look at your interviewing notes, reiterate what they said to you. Now they know you want to be the best listener in their life. And again, they see the value of talking to you. If, if the only time you call them, you're always asking for referrals or you need something or you want them to redeploy and you've never nurtured them or found out how they're doing, that doesn't work anymore. It just doesn't work. You know, they resent it. They resent it. So I don't know that a drip campaign that's strictly emails, I mean, it's better than nothing, but people can delete you too easily. Emails are one of the most ineffective ways of communicating now. You know, texting is great if you want an immediate answer, um, but you know, email is just really losing its effectiveness. I see that we've got another hand raised from Caesar. Uh, Kaylin, can you unmute that for me? Sure, one moment. Um, Toward the top. Hi, this is, uh, what question do you have, Caesar? Caesar with the last name of T. Do you have a question? I think um, it was more the question related to uh, the distribution of the presentation after. Okay, all right, is there nothing else? Well, that's right, he typed something in, okay. Let's see if we have any others. We've got to put Eileen's hand down because she asked her question. Again, if you have any other questions, this is my way of giving you one-on-one -on -one consulting. And I want you to view that as this. When TechServe brings me to you, to you live, this is your ability to get one-on-one -on -one consulting with me. So it doesn't only have to be on redeployment. Any question you have, anything that can help you work your desk, what TechServe Alliance wants, and the reason they have me do training and they bring other speakers to you, is they want to make you as successful as you can possibly be. We want all of you to look at your paycheck and go, wow, look at what I've done, and be the best version of you when it comes to your role in your offices. So please, you know, when you come to these calls, bring your questions, you know, and, and no question is off, you know, off. Online. I mean, you can ask me anything you want. So, you know, the next time we have a call scheduled, write down what's going on between these calls and then bring me your problems. And we can role play. We can go through. I helped somebody close a deal through one of these calls. Um, somebody reached out to me during the call and I reached out to them after and they had a deal going south and it was a direct hire and it was over a $40,000 fee that I helped them close. So, you know, um, TechServe brings me to you to help you and I want you to take advantage of that. And the best way to take advantage of that is to ask me questions because I'd love to give you answers that'll help you. All right, I see no more hands being raised. I see no more questions. Uh, Caitlin, do you want to take over? Sure. Um, let me really quick pull up my notes. Uh, we still have a couple more minutes, so if anyone wants to submit anything, please feel free. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to let everyone know um, that our next two webinars are, um, there's one next week as well as one on May 9th. Um, the one on the 25th is titled From Bad to Worst, Disruption of the H-1B Talent Pipeline. And the one on the 9th, which um, would be, I think, very useful for many of the people on this call, as well as um, counting towards the legal continuing education credits for those of us on the call that are uh, certified. Um, it's titled uh, Staffing Legal Risk, Real Life Stories. And that's um, going to be presented by our um, premium services uh, attorney at law who can uh, talk about some of the uh, situations that he's faced. So uh, we really encourage you to sign up for both of those. You can do so on the website. Um, as I said at the beginning of the call, all of the uh, recordings and presentations for our emails, our webinars are sent out in follow-up emails, um, I believe either later today or Friday. And um, it will directly go to the email that registered. So to, either to answer your question, um, it will go directly to you. And then you can please feel free to forward it to the rest of your team or anyone else that you would like to view it. Um, let's see, are there any other questions? The other thing I want to bring up, Caitlin, is this topic came from you. And so we would like to deliver training that you want to hear. And so, you know, if you could please send any topics to Caitlin that you want me to train on, because I'm willing to train on anything, you know, whether it's sales, whether it's account executive, whether it's, you know, leadership training, whatever you want, we'll deliver. So you have to get your ideas to, you know, to TechServe and then we can customize the training around your needs. So please send your ideas to Caitlin and we'll be glad to deliver the kind of training that you want for you and your team. So please do that as well. You can also submit them at the survey that pops up at the end of the webinar and we would really appreciate that. So um, with that, I think that's about it for us. Thank you so much everyone for joining us. Thank you Barb for the training as always. Um, you can also register for Barb's next session. Uh, we'll put that online very shortly. So uh, looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much.
Thank you, everybody. Bye.